Hello and welcome to Mrs. Law's class. In this lesson, we're going to take a look at how to use slope-intercept form to graph a linear relation. Now, I'm going to take a look back at your turn two, which hopefully you did. I'm going to copy down. So here's the question here. And what I want you to notice is, what is the relationship between the y-intercept and the equation? So if you take a look at the y-intercept, you'll notice that it's 0, 5. And the second one is 0, negative 1. And then what you'll notice is that the y-intercept is actually the same as the constant value in both of those equations. So the point where the graph intersects the y-axis is the same as the constant number in the equation. Now, what do you notice about the slant of the line? Well, we can see from here that the slant goes down for the first one, and we notice that it's because that number or the coefficient in front of the x is negative. When we take a look at the second graph, the second graph slants up, and you'll notice that the coefficient in front of the x is this time positive. So, if the coefficient in front of the x is positive, the graph slants up. And if the coefficient in front of x is negative, the graph slants down. And that's because numbers will be multiplied by this positive or negative number, and it will give um, a constant decrease, as in the first graph, or a constant increase, as in the second graph. The point where the graph intersects the y-axis is actually called the y-intercept, which I've told you before. And the slant of the graph is actually called the slope of the graph. So when we put the slope and the y-intercept together into a linear equation, we get a form called the slope y-intercept form. So in this form, the y has to be isolated, meaning that it has to be on its own. So notice where the slope is. It's the coefficient in front of the x. And the y-intercept is the number, or the constant, added at the end. So notice that in this form, the y value again is isolated. So our x and our y value, they stand for the different points on this line. Now if you're given a graph and you want to find the slope of the graph, we can take any two points from the graph, preferably ones that land on integral values, meaning that they are numbers that actually cross on the lines, and then we're going to draw a triangle connecting these two points to find the rise and run. So let me show you what I mean in a little bit. So the slope is abbreviated by the letter M, and we can say that slope is equal to rise divided by run. You can also think of this as the change in the y value divided by the change in the x values. All right, so let's take a look. So find the slope and y-intercept of each of these lines, and then write the equation. So given L1, which is my line going down here, we're going to pick two points from the line. Now there are a lot of integral points. We can pick these two over here. We can even pick that y-intercept here, and then pick another point up here. And you'll actually see that there's quite a few of them. So no matter which two points I choose, when I draw my triangle, I will notice that my rise is 3 and my run is 1. So even if I pick the two points down here, I can see that my rise is 3 and my run is 1. So we can say that the slope, and I'll put a little 1 subscript because it's from line 1. Now, if I start at the top here and I go down, I would actually then say that my rise is negative 3 but I'm going 1 in the positive direction. So this will be negative 3 divided by 1. Now that also works if I start from the bottom, let's say over here, 
and I run to the left, that would be negative one, and then I'm going to rise up three. So again, this is also the same as three divided by negative one. So no matter how I write this, I will say that the slope is negative three, and therefore my equation is equal to negative three x, and I can see that my y-intercept is right here at negative four. So it'll be negative three x minus four. All right, let's take a look at L2. So again, let's find some integral points. And I have a whole bunch of them again. So if I start on the bottom, I'm gonna run three to the right, so it's positive, and I'm gonna go up two, and that's also positive. So my slope is rise, two, run, three. Now if I look and I start, let's pick a different point to show you. Let's say I start on this point at the top, I'm gonna to run down two, and this time I'm gonna run left, so that's also gonna be negative. So that'll be negative three. So this time my rise is negative two, and my run is negative three. However, the two negatives cancel each other off, so again I get two thirds as my slope. So the equation for the second line is y equals two divided by three x, and we can see that the y-intercept here is at negative one. So we're gonna put minus one. Now in case you forget the rise and the run and the, um, the direction that they're going in, just remember that when lines go um, up and they slant up, the slope is going to be positive. And when the line slants down, the slope is going to be negative. Next, let's take a look at how to apply linear relations to an application problem. So when working with application questions, uh, remember these important things about graphing. So first, we want to increase by the same amount on each of the axes. So for example, the x-axis can increase by 1, and make sure you keep increasing by 1. The y-axis can have a different increase. So let's say we increase by 5, as long as it's consistent for each of the individual axes. Uh, label each axis with what is being measured, and also the units give a title to the graph, and remember to always place the independent variable on the x-axis and the dependent variable on the y-axis. So let's take a look at an example. Bill is an appliance repairman. He makes $50 every time he makes a house call and $30 per hour for his work. So even when he just goes to the house, he's going to make $50 right away. Now we're actually going to start with part B first here. So identify the independent and dependent variable and write a let statement to sorry to define the variables. So we're going to let H equal the number of hours worked, and that's our independent variable. And then we're going to let A equal the amount earned. And that is the dependent variable because the amount earned depends on how many hours are worked. So now let's go to our table and we'll come back later to write the equation. So since H is our independent variable, we're going to place that first in our table and the amount earned in our second column. So uh, for H, we can start with uh, zero. It's always nice to start with zero. And then we'll increase by one. Now I didn't make enough space for my in my table, so I'm actually going to add one more time, four hours, because it's always nice to have at least five points. So now we're going to plug these numbers um, into our um, problem. So when he works zero hours, he's still going to get paid $50. So the amount is 50. When he works one hour, he's going to get paid $50 just for arriving, plus $30 per hour. So that's going to be $80. For two hours, it would be 50 plus 30 and then plus 30. Or we can times that by two. And so that will give us 110. 
dollars. Okay, and then we have 50 plus 30 times 3 hours, and that will give me $140. And then lastly, we get 50 times 30, sorry, plus 30 times 4, and that gives me $170. So if you can fit it in the table, let's put this dollars, and we'll put this as our hours. Sometimes, actually, instead of putting hours, sometimes people even put T for time. But you know what? We'll keep it as H. All right, so uh, write an equation to describe the amount that Bill earns. So actually, even just taking a look at our pattern in our how we wrote the equation, we can see that the amount earned is equal to 50 plus 30 times whatever our time is. So I'm going to rewrite it as 30 times H, that's how many hours he works, plus 50. All right, let's plot these points into or onto our graph. So we have a zero here, and our time is on the bottom. And that's going to be in hours. And because we only go up to four, I'm going to skip count every two squares to be one hour. And then we need to go all the way up to 170. So I'm going to actually skip count vertically by 20. Okay, we're going to label this as amount earned. And that's in dollars. And we'll give it this a title, which is Bill's Earnings. By hour. All right, so let's plot our points. And then we'll grab a ruler to connect our points. And there you have our graph. Now I do have a question down here which asks, does it make sense to connect the points? And I kind of went ahead and I connected them. But yes, we can connect the points because time is actually continuous. Okay, so let's write that down for us. So yes, we can connect the points. because time is continuous and then also because we can have the values in between for example and we can have 1.5 hours or 1.3 hours And this leads us to our last question. So estimate how much Bill would make if he worked 3.5 hours. So when we estimate a value inside the graph, because we notice that 3.5 hours is here on our x-axis, we follow this value up to our graph, and it's approximately right there. So estimating a value inside the graph is called interpolation. So Estimating where this value is here, we know that this is 150, and that seems to be in between 150 and 160. So we're going to guess $155, or we're going to estimate $155. When you take a guess outside of the graph, such as for five, six, seven, or eight, or nine hours, that is called extrapolation and in order for us to do that we actually have to extend our line so that it actually reaches five six seven eight or nine or ten hours and that's how you do an application problem involving linear relations